Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Title of the message this afternoon is The Saints' Prayers and God's Wrath. The Saints' Prayers, not, not prayers to the saints. Those, those prayers don't get answered, but <laughs> the saints' prayers, which if everybody knows the saints are believers, okay? The saints are believers. Amen. The saints' prayers and God's wrath. You can see in the chapter probably where I'm going with this. But uh, let's talk about that for a second. So some interpret this as I've heard people say, like, this is the praises. You know, all the praises are being lifted up to God. They're in the vials or whatever. And certainly I can see where they, some people get that, especially they have harps. And there's a lot of verses. We'll look at some here in a little bit have to do with singing praises to God and what have you. But I think in the context here with the prayer and the suffering and having just come out of tribulation and all, when you read this, that these prayers that are being talked about are prayers of like, God, you know, take care of these people. These, the, you know, these guys have been persecuting Christians and, and uh, you know, how long before you're going to cast out your, your judgment upon them and, 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 and such prayers like that. And we got to remember as Christians that God hears our prayers and is sensitive to them. Like, it's hard to understand because in my mind, I'm often thinking, hey, he already knows what we need before we ask for it. And he already knows what's going to happen and, and all this. And so sometimes we start forgetting, like, prayer is important. And different people, you know, might have to cry out in different ways. You know, some people maybe cry a lot. I mean, like, literally weeping whenever they're praying. Some people, uh, uh, you know, pray a lot of the imprecatory type prayers. You know, I'm not one that does that. I mean, it's just not a common practice of mine. But some people, it's like they need that to give them reassurance that wicked people in the world are going to be dealt with. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so they, so they need that. And, and uh, d there's different types of prayers, but God knows all of us. He knows our heart. And actually, we, we understand this, that even he even understands our prayers or our outcries to him when we're not even physically praying. You know, something happens. And he knows our suffering and our anguish. And sometimes our heart's crying out to him, even though nothing like physically and verbally comes. Look at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. <clears throat> Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we shall pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so I... I don't know. I, I've been in times like that where I'm like, I don't even know what I need, God, but I need something. Like, I'm just, something's not feeling right. I'm just not in a good place, and I need, and, and I'm just crying out to God about something. I don't even know uh, what it is. But God hears those prayers. God hears those prayers when the situation, it seems like it's too late, and you're almost like, well, I guess God didn't hear, or He, he didn't, you know, want to answer it the way I thought He was going to answer it, and so... We just kind of feel like, hey, it's done. You know, we can stop praying for it or whatever. No, you know, remember that he's hearing prayers and he knows his children. He knows what we're needing. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, look at verse 10. <clears throat> well, let's start with verse 9, actually. Genesis 4, verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? We all know what happened. Cain already killed, killed Abel. And then it says, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I've always thought that verse is so interesting. You know, God knows that Abel was, was martyred, and it even talks about this throughout the Bible. You know, it makes reference to him being killed. And and God knows that that happened, and God heard that voice. I mean, he's already dead, but he's like the blood is crying out. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, so he so he hears his children, even whenever we don't know what to cry or call out to him and what we need to pray. He hears his children even whenever we think, well, that's, I mean, it's too late. You know, it's already been done. There's nothing you can do about it, whatever. Look at Genesis 21. Genesis 21, just want to start just a couple thoughts here about how God deals with the prayers of saints. And again, that saints is just a, people who are sanctified, those who 
are in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're, you're sanctified. I realize there's a process of in this body, like becoming a better Christian, but in God's stand, like in our standing before God, once you're saved, you're a saint. Okay, so the Bible's consistent in using that and uh, in calling us that. Genesis 21, verse 17. And God heard the voice of the lad. This is when Hagar, uh, let's just back up. So, uh, uh, Verse 14, Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and the water was spent in the bottle. And she cast her child under one of the shrubs and she went and sat her down over against uh, him a good way off as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of, the God, uh, angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where, where he is. And so she's, you know, God heard the lad. God heard Hagar. In fact, previously he had answered Hagar for something similar. When she said, you know, her handmaid had sent, I mean, her, uh, Sarah had sent her away. And so she was, uh, she was saying that, you know, she was crying out to God and God heard. So, you know, the Bible tells us to make our requests known. And, uh, you know, I, I, I truly believe, I mean, I, I know this, this, is, uh, this is like everybody in here knows this, I understand. But I truly believe it's imperative that Christians have a prayer walk with God. We have a prayer life. You know, we actually spend time, we wake up in the morning Read your Bible, pray. Easy to start forgetting that. It's easy to start failing in, in bringing your prayers before God, you know, because you just think, like, I don't really need that. I was thinking about that this morning. Like, oftentimes, you know, I grew up in, it was almost like in church, there was almost like over prayer. Not that that can actually be a thing, but over prayer, like you pray before this, you pray before that, and right before the message, he prays again, and I'm thinking, he just prayed, you know. And so sometimes it feels like we're just, you know, hopefully it's not just a, a, a formality where you're just saying some certain words before God or something like that. But no, there are times like this morning is a good example. I just felt like, you know, I started talking about some things in the, in the introduction and kind of got derailed. And I felt like, man, I'm going to just butcher this if I try to do it in my own strength. So I prayed, you know, before I preached. And uh, we were talking about that on the way up here where it seems like God gave me liberty and allowed my thoughts to be clearer. And all. look, God answers prayers. He knows what we want. He hears that. He wants to hear us pray. And they move him. Like they're, they're literally, our prayers soften his heart, you know. And, uh, and we have to become people of prayer. Uh, this message that I'm preaching, obviously we're, we're going to be in Revelation 8 there. But this message is mostly about the effect of our prayer and the effect that it has on the wrath that God pours, pours out on wickedness. But I'm not just talking about imprecatory prayers. Now, imprecatory prayers, uh, they're in the Bible. David, for instance, again, he's one of those guys. I've never been in this situation. I've never had people trying to kill me. I've never had people doing me so wicked, you know, uh, that I felt like I had to pray, God, take him out. <laughs> you know, I've never felt like that. So I, I, I don't, I'm not in just this routine. I don't think that we have to, like every day, like as part of our prayers, think about somebody to pray death upon or something like that. I don't think that that's something that we have to incorporate. But if we're going to sing the Psalms, obviously David has some imprecatory prayers that are in there in the Psalms. And so what an imprecatory prayer is, is, is actually a negative prayer. You're not wishing something good upon somebody, but something bad. And the reason that you would do that is because they're hindering the work of God. They're keeping people from getting saved or they're hurting people. You know, and you want that to stop, and so you're praying for God to intervene on that. That's not a bad thing. You know, that's something that Christians uh, should do as well. But number one, I just want to point out how God is sensitive to the saints' cries for mercy. Okay, and uh, if you look at Genesis 8, Genesis 8, After the flood, we read this in verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, 
and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And this is going to be important. This is going to come back up in Revelation 8. Okay, But he smelled the sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Isn't that true? Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, the earth ain't gonna remain for, isn't going to remain forever, though. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Okay, So we see uh, Noah offers burnt offering and the Lord smells it. It's a sweet smelling savor, like an incense. Okay, You would understand that terminolo terminology. He smells that. And it is pleasing to him. Now, th this is exactly why God spares, has spared the world several times from just total annihilation, for one thing. This is why he spares certain people out of any wrath that he pours out in judgment upon the wicked world. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, look at verse 21. <clears throat> Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation. And this is what we're talking about in Revelation 8. We've got to this point now, the opening of all the seals. And now we're getting right before the, the, the wrath's poured out, but we've, we've, we've kind of gone through the tribulation. I already talked about that in previous lessons. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And I'll show you here in a minute, you know, why are those days shortened for the elect? Because the elect get a hold of God's heart. And God's not going to destroy, you know, destroy them entirely with the rest of the world. Okay, uh, back to, uh, let me see here, back to Genesis... Do I want to go there? Yeah, back to Genesis 6. All right, back to the story of Noah. This is before the flood now, okay? I'm not going to deal with some of the, the uh, doctrines that are surrounding this text here. We're just going to read it. Genesis 6, look at verse 1 there. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I mean, this is what happens when God sees the wickedness of the world. I was talking about this morning how, you know, the angels, uh, the angels bring report, you know, of, of the wickedness of this earth. And so you see, like, for instance, when the... Uh, two angels went down and down into Sodom to see the wickedness of the land, and somehow that that brings it before God's eyes and said, "This place is wicked, needs to be destroyed." And it like brings this this vindication on the fact that God's getting ready to wipe them out, you know. And they have to see that, and they see the wickedness, and they and they experience it firsthand. Well, here it is. He sees the wickedness of the earth, and he says, "I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man." and beast, and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And look at verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, was it because he was without sin? No, I'm sure he had wickedness to bring to the table like we all do. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I love that phrase because it makes you think about, you know, when you're getting ready to uh, discipline your child, and they look up at you with their eyes, and you're just like... Man, I can't, I can't do it, <laughs> right? 
because they found grace in your eyes. You know, that's why before you, uh, before you discipline your kids, you got to put a blindfold on or something like that, you know, because, <laughs> uh, cause they find grace in your eyes, you know? And, and so this is, this is the, the, the kind of similar to what I feel God does. You know, he wants, he has to pour out wrath on wickedness, but he sees his people and he, and, and they get a hold of his heart and he will change his mind. But remember the opposite is true too. So if he's, you know, getting ready to pour wrath upon on somebody and he's got his child coming to him saying, you know, God, aren't you going to judge them for what they did to me? You know, now we might say we, we could we could say we could judge somebody who who made such a prayer or claim or said, I can't believe that person. You know, they deserve this or they deserve that. And we would say, well, now, hold on. Kind of this holier than thou, like now you're wicked, too. Like you said, just be merciful on them. Hey, who cares about all that? God knows their heart. He knows their suffering. He knows that they've been persecuted or whatever, however they're feeling. And he knows their heart. And, and, and just like any parent will with his child, you know, you mess with my child. <laughs> I mean, that's how you start feeling, right? Moms especially. I've been picking on moms all day long. <laughs> moms especially. Don't mess with my boy. You know, we had a bus route in Oklahoma City. And uh, we went into some kind of ghetto type neighborhoods. And uh, kids got in fights a lot. And every once in a while, a mom would find out that somebody on the bus was messing with her son or something like that. And she would just hang out until we pulled up to the bus stop and opened the door. And she would just force herself in there and said, now, who did it? Who did it? And I'm like, oh, boy, we're going to have we're going to have a death on, on the on bus 15. <laughs> right? And it was bad. One time we had these two kids fighting two girls. And one was this big girl. She would have just killed the other girl. The other girl was a little skinny twig. And, and this big girl, she just had rage in her eyes and she was getting ready. And I was trying to break up the fight. So one person was holding uh, uh, the other girl and I took the big girl and I held her and we're trying to pull them apart. Well, the other guy was not as strong as I was. And he kind of, that girl got, got loose. And here I've got this lady's arms pinned up. Uh, this girl's arms pinned up, and that, that that skinny girl came up and whacked her right in the face while I'm holding her arms. <laughs> I thought her mom's gonna kill me, <laughs> and she wasn't happy. That's for sure. But uh, but you know, you don't like to hear that somebody messed with your child, and so you know, you kind of think about that's a little bit how it is with God. Now that's important. That's going to be important as we get back to uh, Revelation eight. But look at uh, Genesis eighteen. Got a few more here. Genesis 18. I could tell you all kind of stories of fights that happen on the bus. Genesis 18, look at verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, and Abraham's Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the wicked, I mean the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there were fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and spare not the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far, uh, let's see. Yeah. That be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee, shall not the judge of the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place, place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack uh, five and fifty righteous Shall thou destroy all the city for lack of, of, uh, of five? And he said, If I find there forty and five, uh, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let the, not the Lord be angry, and I will speak peradventure. There shall thirty be found there. And he, and he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak. I mean, Abraham's a good negotiator. That's probably why he had so many camels and, <laughs> and uh, uh, riches and stuff. Okay, servants. Uh, Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, O Lord, 
How many sides? I'm sorry. Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing uh, with Abraham. And Abraham returned unto his place. Man, he talked him all the way down to ten. He said, yeah, you can find ten people. I won't destroy it. Of course, there wasn't even ten righteous people <laughs> in the city. And so, uh, so we know how that goes. Look at chapter 19. Verse 12, And the men said unto Lot, these are the two angels that came down, I believe, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So the angels are going to destroy it, but he says, hey, we're going to get the, the righteous out of there. Now, I, I don't know. I have a hard time calling, calling Lot righteous, but God said he was righteous in God's eyes, right? Lot was righteous. I definitely have a hard time calling his daughters righteous, but he got his daughters out of there. His wife, he got out of there. She turned back, turned to a pillar of salt, but I'm just saying, like, like, like these weren't like the best, you know, most righteous, most holy, most upright people that existed, but they were people who God considered his, his children, people who God... Uh, uh, you know, had a heart for, but even more so, probably the intercession of Abraham. And Abraham was calling out to God and he was doing this. But look, the cry of the wickedness that was going on still had to be dealt with. And, the, and, and, uh, and look, there was a lot of sin going on, innocence destroyed. I mean, you think of the, they were surrounded around the city and the wickedness and the vileness that they were wanting to do and that they had probably done countless times before. It says children were with them, you know. Now, how did children get involved in the gross sin that they were fixing to do except that they had been also perverted and trained and taught how to do that way? And so we're talking about some wicked people who had done some wicked things to, to innocent people, and God has got to destroy that because the cry of that was great. So he, he, he's sensitive to the cries of the saints on both ends for mercy, also sensitive to those who are, are struggling and, and, uh, and are asking for justice. Now, the, so the first point is that just God is sensitive to the, to the saints' cries for mercy. But I want to make sure we understand this, that this doesn't mean that he delivers us out of all suffering that's going to be on this earth. You know, think of the examples I just mentioned. Do you really think that Noah and his family were just exempt from all the wickedness and the filthy imagination and all the stuff that was going on there in the days of Noah? No, they still had to struggle with that. They were probably still mocked. They were probably persecuted. They were still, you know, having to see all the wickedness in the land and the violence and everything that was going on in those days. What about Lot? You know, do you think that Lot was just spared from all the wickedness that was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? No, he was there. It says it vexed his righteous soul daily. Like, you know, he was con continually vexed by this. We don't know to what degree, you know, even, uh, even persecuted or whatever. But, uh, but God's people are still going to go through this world, experience the wickedness, experience the persecution, experience trials and tribulations. That's to be expected. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter four verse twelve. I want to say this to people that act, uh, other Christians that act like Christians are just exempt from any sufferings or pain or trials, and it's like, oh no, God wouldn't do that. God's going to bless us, as if blessing just means like He's just going to drop down a bunch of money from heaven and and there's luxuries and all this, you know, life's going to be good. You've been blessed. Gold ring, you know, nice suit. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like this, this is what the world that calls themselves Christians, the hypocrites that call themselves Christians, this is what they say God's blessings upon them. But we see great men of God, great women of God, who had God's blessings upon them, and they lived through some trying times, some terrible times, right. some times of persecution. And 1 Peter 4, 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which is uh, to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice 
in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, uh, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye shall be glad also with exceeding joy. See, a Christian, uh, look, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's hard to explain or, or hard to, you certainly don't desire rough times in your life, but it's something that a Christian should get to the point where when those things come, it magnifies God's grace because you're like, hey, I'm going through this, even though I've got the protection from God and the love of God upon my life and I'm able to do His will. And it's just like you're walking around this wicked world with like a bubble, right? That's protecting you from, from some of the wickedness. Not that you're exempt from it, from it somehow, uh, somehow um, getting, you know, affecting you, but that you still have peace of, you know, in the Lord. You still have strength. You still have the ability to get through these kinds of things. That's the kind of peace that, that, that the Bible promises. Okay, so go back to Revelation now. And let's back up to Revelation 6. And we've looked through the different seals. And we know that the seals involved a lot of things that weren't supernatural events that God uh, poured out upon the earth, but they were events that happened that we've seen happen before. World wars, we ever seen world wars? Yes. You know, famines, have we ever seen famines, pestilence? Yes, we've seen all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, 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 people killing other people and, and arresting them and all that. We've seen all those kinds of things, and that's what was going on in these seals, uh, which is the, uh, the uh, tribulation time. And in chapter 6, verse 10, and they cry, this is the, uh, those who were uh, the, 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 under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Verse 10 says, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? They wanted vengeance. Say, wait, 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 nobody should ever ask for vengeance. Like, that's a carnal Christian. If you want vengeance poured out upon someone that did you wrong, you know, you're supposed to do good to those that do evil to you. Uh, well, here's the problem with that philosophy. These people were in heaven. They're already perfect in their perfect bodies. And they're in heaven and they're saying, how long, Lord, before you avenge us? Because <laughs> we know it's coming. We know you're going to be justified in taking care of those people. Look, on earth... Somebody smacks me in the face, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but <laughs> if they smack me in the face, it would be a God-honoring thing for me to be offer this the other cheek. You understand how that how that goes. And Jesus is teaching not to necessarily retaliate because somebody does you wrong, somebody's uh, cussing you out, you don't need to get back in their face and, and retaliate in that way. He's saying, look, take the evil, okay, take it, and just know that God's going to deal with that. In fact, if you want to get even yourself, you're missing out on an opportunity because you're the one that's going to end up paying for that. And God's not going to avenge you like you wish that he would avenge you. Does that make sense? So look, don't try to take it in your own hand. Leave it in God's hands. And you just go upon earth just thinking, hey, just brush that off. No big deal. It's not hurting me. God's still on the throne. And, uh, and everything's okay. So... Uh, but it seems like here the saints that are in heaven, they know it's getting close. They, uh, they know that, but not everybody yet has been persecuted, uh, and, and it's not time for God to actually pour His wrath out, but it's getting super close. So they're like, how long? How long? Okay, so now I, I, I mentioned here a while back that there's this, this, like when the seventh seal is open, this is when the, the wrath is going to be poured out upon the earth. Okay, And of course I believe... Uh, and if we've exp I've explained this a little bit. I believe the rapture happens before that seven seal is open. Okay, and we read that. There's this little interlude with the 144,000, and then there's a great multitude in heaven. That seems most likely, and it lines up with Matthew 24 and other prophecies about people coming up from the grave and all that right at that time. Okay, so the, that would be the resurrection. And now the wrath's going to be poured out. But we talked about how like this is just like the uh, the uh, climax of the story. And, and, and John has this vision of heaven, and he sees all the angels worshiping God and, and, the, and the elders and everybody that worshiping God. But then there's like this silence in heaven, and we know that something's going to happen that's real big and it's before this wrath is poured out. Because this is an important event that they've been waiting for. Because right at, now, all God's, at, at, at the point that God's wrath is poured out on the earth, all God's people are saved. 
right? We already read that. It says, for the elect's sake, you know, those days shall be shortened. Uh, those that endure to the end shall be saved. What it's talking about is those who made it to that point where the Lord takes, the, takes us out, right? We're safe. We're all in heaven. Nothing to worry about. That's an exciting time because everything from then on out is just God pouring out His wrath and preparing the world that remains for the setting up of His kingdom. Okay, And so during that time, they're in heaven and they're saying, uh, how long, how long? Okay, and then he says, after a little season. Okay, so after a little season, the, uh, the saints are going to be avenged. Now, when there are no saints left to cry out for God's mercy on the earth, you know, there's nobody saying, hey, what about for 50's sake, Lord? Hey, there's no more righteous. <laughs> there's no more righteous. What about just if there were 10, Lord, would you, for, would you, you know, save it for 10? Hey, look, every saved person at that point's in heaven. Amen. So what's left is just the wickedness of the world that God's just going to pour down His wrath like He did on Sodom and Gomorrah, like He did on the earth in Noah's days, which incidentally God says, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. I mean, there's a lot of similarities right there. So after He removes God's people, the wrath is going to be poured out. Okay. Now, here's the part that I want you to notice. Look at chapter 8. Took me a long time to get to our text, but here we are. <laughs> Luke chapter, I mean, uh, Acts, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto them much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, probably it would help for us to have an image of what the, the altar looked like back then, and the Holy of Holies, and all that that, that was in the temple, which was apparently just somewhat of a picture of what heaven is set up like. So now do you remember when I drew on the board about the cherub, I mean the cherubim, and then there was a, a, a big like firmament above that, and, and then there was a throne sitting on there. And and look, I don't know exactly how it's all laid out, but you know how he talked about the souls that are under the altar, you know. Well, in the in the temple, I'm on verse four, remember. In the temple, uh there was uh, in the in the Holy of Holies, there was the uh the Ark of the Covenant, right? And there was what was called the mercy seat, right? And, and it, interestingly enough, it had cherubim that were on there. And I think all this was a picture, like I said, of, of the picture that we saw in chapter 4 whenever John is seeing this vision of heaven and he's seeing all that. And we compared it to Ezekiel and Isaiah and all these places where he, where he saw this thing. And so this is a picture of what's going on in heaven. And so when these souls are under the altar, right, my mind was always thinking, hey, the altar is not very big, <laughs> right? But probably he's talking about like this big, you know, in this vision that he saw in heaven, God sitting upon the throne and, and the big firmament under him. I, I, I don't know, but these, these souls are there and they're waiting for this wrath to be poured out. And so in the uh, temple, again, one of the jobs of some of the priests, some of the priests had the specific job of going to the altar, the altar of incense, and they would uh, take a, a bowl or, or a vial, and they would have ins it would have incense in it, and they would go and they would light that light that. There was a special concoction that they had to make. The Old Testament describes like what the ingredients were, and there's a special thing that they had to make. And this was going to be a, a, a incense that God would smell, and it would be like a sweet smelling savor. Okay, so they would put that, and then His glory would fill the temple. Right, so so. Probably people that were well familiar with that when they heard, you know, John talking about this vision and he's explaining his vision, they probably could see, have a rough idea. They learned this, they probably learned this in grade school, you know, what the layout was and, and everything. So they had a, an idea of what he's talking about there. But he says, not only is he offering up these incense to God, but they've got these vials. And he talked about these vials in chapter 5, Revelation 5, look at verse 8. Revelation 5, 8. And when he had taken the book, 
the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now let's read that again in chapter 8. Verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hands. Okay, and he took and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings uh, and an earthquake. So it seems like it, what we're reading about here is that all the believers are gone. Nobody begging for mercy anymore. There's nobody on the earth who's righteous who's saying, wait, God, what about me? Have mercy on me. No, we already talked about last week how, like, I don't even believe anybody's getting saved. There's a possibility of it, like, towards the end of, of the wrath or something like that. But, but I don't even think, I think it just keeps on referring to how they, they, they didn't repent and they kept doing all their wickedness and they, they're, not, they're not seeing that because, look, the Holy Spirit's out of here. All the Christians are out of here. Everything that's left is just wickedness, okay? And so now all you have are these saints saying, how long before you avenge, you know, us? And so now he's getting ready to pour out his wrath upon the earth. But first, they've got these vials, which are the prayers of the saints. That seems so interesting to me. I don't know if it goes back all throughout history. Like every time a prayer goes up and somebody's asking God for mercy, or every time somebody's crying because somebody did them wrong, uh, you know, in the name of Christ, and they... And, and, and they're just trying to do right, but then they were persecuted for it and all that. Maybe, maybe he's got records of all that. I don't know how symbolic it is, but these vials that contain this sweet-smelling savor to the Lord, which is the prayer of the saints. And it gets poured out into that, that, uh, uh, that incense and cast this down into the earth. Now, I haven't even, we haven't even picked up the, the trumpet judgments yet. This is just like the beginning of, of the whole deal. Look at uh, verse, uh, well, I already read verse 4 and 5. Look at, uh, uh, let's go to Psalm, okay? So these prayers are added to the fire, and it's kind of like, if I can use the phrase, fuel for the fire. Fuel for the fire, like making it hotter. God's already going to cast His judgment out. So what's the prayer of the saints all about? And it's like, this is just adding fuel to the fire. Look at Psalm. Interesting uh, here in, in the Psalms that there's some, some similarities, some of the things that David says in regards to this, uh, uh, the judgment of God. Okay, uh, Psalm 43. Let's go to Psalm 43. Psalm 43. Psalm 43. And David says, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why doth thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? David felt like he's oppressed and the enemy is persecuting. He's like, I don't understand why this is happening. He's asking God to deliver him. O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto the holy hill and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God. Unto God, my exceeding joy. Uh, yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my strength. Look, when you're down and you think, man, I don't understand. Like, life is just so bad. I mean, I thought I'm a child of God. I don't know why I'm getting this kind of treatment or getting stabbed in the back or whatever kind of bad thing is going on. Like you can rest assured, like God's, God's got your back. And when we go to Him and we're praying and He's like going to the altar, you know, and saying, look, I'm offering this before God uh, as an incense, you know, He is going to take care of it. Look at uh, 141 now, Psalm 141. Psalm 141, look at verse 2.
Let my prayers, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. You see a lot of similarity between this. So this picture of what's going on in Revelation and this and the prayers of the saints being offered upon that incense, uh, I think really helps us. Now, go to Revelation 14 real quick. And this is what I'm going to be talking about in Iola, uh, kind of jumping way ahead, but then we'll go back because we're only in the first few chapters of uh, in Iola. But, but I want to point this out because in, uh, in Iola we're talking about things which must be hereafter. Okay, so we're already ahead of that. But, you know, after he deals with the vision of the churches, the seven churches, he says, now write the things which must be hereafter. And so we talked about how, uh, you know, look, since the, those times, the time since the Bible was completed, like there's been kingdoms that have risen, and Christians been persecuted. I mean, there's there's always been bad forms of government and all this kind of stuff. And and like several things happen, like the events in 70 A.D., for instance, right? That very parallel a lot of what's going to happen in the la, in the in the, the tribulation time. And when those things come, it's going to be worse. Like all these are just little pictures throughout history. And when this comes, it's going to be like the worst of the worst. But here's a, so, so what, what I'm going to talk about tonight is this. When we see this in Revelation, though, it's really interesting because we see it twice. We see it repeated twice. We see all these events leading up to Re Revelation 11. And, when we, and we'll get there, so I'm not going to labor too much on it. But when we read chapter 11, it's like the end. The kingdoms are, are, are delivered over to, to Christ, right? He's setting up his kingdom it's all prepared. And then all of a sudden you go to chapter 12 and it's like, what, what are we, we we're telling this story all over again. Well, that happens throughout the Bible multiple times where a story is told and then it's told again. You know, you got Exodus and then you got Deuteronomy. It tells the same story as Exodus. You got 1 Kings and 2 Kings and then you got 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. tells a story all over again like you just read. Uh, even in Genesis, there's the creation story and then there's kind of like the creation of man is told all over again. The Gospels, you got Matthew, and then all of a sudden you read Mark, Luke, most of John. Some of John is, uh, is quite a bit different. Telling the story all over again, right? So the things that are important, God wants to be told. He wants it to be told from different angles so we can get the whole picture of it. So I only said that, and we'll, we'll get to that, and I'll talk more about it at a later time. But I only say that because we can look again and see a very similar situation in the second half of Revelation, okay? So if we get to uh, chapter 14... We see the 144,000 all over again. Like last week, we talked about the ceiling of the 144,000. We see that taking place all over again, which would be the time around the same time as the rapture. And so there's some, some wording in there that kind of parallels uh, chapter 6, which we already looked at. And look at chapter 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, uh, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed me saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark in his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith in Jesus. Do you see the same kind of idea that you got the, pace, the, the patience of the saints? You got God, you, God's people just continuing to live for him continuing to do right even in the face of persecution. And you say, well, uh, we're not really dealing with that right now. And that's, I would agree with that. But you can see where it's going to come pretty quickly. And, you can, and we can read the Bible and know that, hey, we might, get, we might not get the worst of it. Maybe some other countries are going to get it worse or something like that. But Christians are going to be persecuted more than they've ever been persecuted before. And, uh, and throughout history, some already, you know, many people already have been persecuted and martyred for their faith and all that. But the patience of the saints is they keep on serving the Lord. They keep on doing what they're supposed to do. And in the end, the indignation, right? The cup of his indignation. I love the word pictures in Revelation. Cup of his indignation is going to be poured out, right? 
And some of that was fueled, that fire was fueled by the prayer of the saints. And so if you ever feel down and feel like, I just can't take this, I don't understand, you know, why am I being treated this way or whatever, look, take it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Like, like, you know, just visualize that He's bottling up those prayers and one day they're going to be poured out when His wrath is poured on the wickedness of the earth. <clears throat> but the, my conclusion for all of us to get an application out of this is, for the most part right now, I'm not just hoping that everybody in Kansas City and everybody in Iola just like, hey, fine, you didn't get saved, you didn't come to our church, then God's wrath is going to be poured out upon you. That would be silly. <laughs> right? We're not at that point yet. So what would I compare it to what our job is supposed to, do, to be right now? In the midst of different wickedness going on, and the fact that we can see the day of the wrath of God, it's coming, like it's over the hill. It's, it's, it's you know, I feel like it's getting somewhat close. It's going to get wickeder and wickeder, and then eventually that wrath's going to be poured out. What do we do in the meantime? And my mind goes to what the angels told Lot. Now, unfortunately, Lot had messed up his testimony. You know, he went, he said, he said, Hath ye, uh, uh, hast thou any here besides? Brother, you know, sons-in-laws, you know, who, whoever. Who, is there anybody else? You can tell, it kind of reminds, reminds me also of Rahab. Rahab the harlot. It was like, hey, you put that, res, you put that scarlet thread, uh, and, and I'm not going to, we're not going to, uh, you know, whenever we take down Jericho, you're going to be spared. And it said, and anybody who's in your house, anyone's in your house, you could go out and you could get your, your family members and your friends and all these people and say, hey, don't tell anybody, but just come in here and you'll be safe and, and, and all in there. Look, Noah's Ark, theoretically, probably could have filled that up with anybody that would say, hey, I don't want to be rained on. <laughs> and they could have got inside the boat and they could have been saved. So he tells Lot, he says, hey, hast thou any here besides? Knowing the fire's getting ready to come down. It's only a matter of time where he, God's patience has come to an end and all God's people are taken out and everyone who's left is just part of the wickedness in which God's going to pour out His wrath. So what do we as Christians do? Well, come on. I mean, it's pretty obvious. And I think all of us kind of have a heart for this, but we have got to go find those who aren't, you know, uh, we, they're not rejecting Christ. They just don't know. They just don't heard the gospel. They don't know the truth. We need to go find those family members. We don't want them to go to hell. And we got to say, hey, you, you know, we've got to have this conversation. This conversation. You're going to have to get saved because God's wrath is coming. You know, uh, eternity in hell. I mean, you know, the, just calling fire down and destroying this earth is just only a, a, a smidgen of it. When they're cast into the lake of fire for all eternity, I mean, that's, that's God's wrath being poured out to the fullest, right, in the presence of the Lamb. And so, uh, and so our job is to do, like Noah was supposed to do, go preach the gospel. Now, I didn't see a lot of people getting saved in Noah's day. It doesn't seem like it to me. You know, Lot, go preach the gospel. I don't see a lot of people in Lot's days getting saved, you know. But I still see people getting saved nowadays, so we still got, there's still hope for this world. <laughs> And we still need to go out there and we need to do that job. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the calling to which, in which you've called us. And I pray that you will help us, uh, Father, to live for you and to think about our family and friends, neighbors, people in this community, uh, people that we have um, the opportunity to go out and preach the gospel to. I pray you just... Uh, encourage us, put this thought before our minds uh, when, we, when we lack motivation uh, to go do it. I know I'm guilty many times just not really having the zeal that I, I should have for lost souls. But Lord, help spark that desire in me as I look around and think about the judgment that you're going to cast out upon this world. And there might be times where there's somebody so wicked, such a hater of God, that we think, hey, that's, we know what their end is and what this is what their just reward is. But Lord, help us not just feel like that about everybody. Help us understand that a lot of people, uh, they're not totally hardened against you. They just need to be convinced. They just need to see uh, the power of your word and hear it preached to them. And I pray you help us, Lord, continue to put our effort in even to a greater degree that we might see souls saved and one for you and then train them up, Lord, how to go out 
and make disciples as well, Father. I pray you be honored and glorified by our work and that when we are suffering any kind of persecution, which we don't even know right now, Lord, that we would be patient and we would be faithful and we would endure and, uh, and strengthen us and give us the peace to get us through those kinds of times. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.